August the 6th, 1945, an American B-29 bomber drops the first ever atomic bomb over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. At least 140,000 people are killed in the attack. Tens of thousands more die later because of the effects of radiation. Ever since the end of the Second World War, there's been an international consensus and effort to contain the spread of nuclear weapons. The global community has created several organizations and signed treaties to prevent potential nuclear attacks. As of today, nine countries have admitted to possessing nuclear weapons. But only five are part of the 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which calls on its signatories to open the doors for inspection by the International Atomic Energy Agency. The IAEA is one of the organizations promoting the peaceful use of nuclear technology while a 1996 treaty banned all nuclear tests for both civilian and military purposes. But there are 12 states which have neither signed nor ratified the treaty. Among them are three with nuclear weapons, North Korea, India and Pakistan. With North Korea launching missiles and the growing conflict between India and Pakistan, can the world prevent a nuclear attack? The Executive Secretary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, Dr. Lassina Zerbo, talks to Al Jazeera. Lassina Zerbo, uh, Executive Secretary for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you for um, having me. Can we start really with the thought that peace and stability was hard fought after the Second World War. Two nuclear bombs hit Japan in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and it brought the stark reality of what nuclear warfare could do to this planet for the global community to come together and say, we shouldn't ever use these in war or conflict. Many decades have passed since that agreement as such, and certainly since that incident. How problematic has proliferation and nuclear development become in the decades following the Second World War to where we are now in 2019. You put it right. I think we, it's been nearly 75 years that uh, you know, the two bombs were detonated in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And since then, there have been a lot of discussion, international agreement, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, and many disarmament and non-proliferation ag agreement to try and, uh, and find a way to stop what the world saw as very devastating uh, for all of us, for our planet. And how could we prepare the next generation for a more peaceful and harmonious world? That has been the challenge for the past years. But have we succeeded? I think we're now facing the same situation as if we were the day after the, two bomb the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Because today, still, the most crucial political, moral, and uh, I would say social challenge is how to stop nuclear explosion from happening on this planet again. Indeed, and various politicians on various continents have their own issues and worries, concerns and needs regarding either nuclear technology or a, a nuclear armament. So let's begin in the Middle East, mm. because the collapse of the Iran nuclear agreement has been headline news for at least since President Trump came into power, um, forcing really the European signatories to that uh, document uh, to generally take sides. It's still a difficult situation. How do you read it at this moment? It is a difficult situation for all of them, for US, for Europe and for Iran. Foreign Minister Zarif, uh, he gave a keynote speech at uh, the opening of the Munich Security Conference core group. Uh, one of the things that he said was to sum up the situation in the Middle East, he said things shouldn't be taken in a zero-sum game. Because you have to find a deal where everyone feels victorious. That's what a great deal could be. But a deal is never perfect. The deal is perfectible. What Iran is looking at today, despite the situation in the US, is that Europe stands on its commitment. That's what Foreign Minister Zarif is talking about. But we have to find a situation where we put 
I mean, we sacrifice our pride and ego to a certain extent and then to look at the interests of humanity, the interests of the international community. And that's a difficult task. But it's a task that is possible and that we have to strive for. If it is a task that is possible, how yeah. does your organisation fit into that, considering the UN are involved uh, and, and various other interested parties and stakeholders who are, dare I say, whispering in the ears of their various allies, whether it be the US, whether it be the European partners or even Iran? Precisely so, I think our organization, like the overall UN context, we're here to contribute to peace and stability. Uh, but we can only contribute if people take us seriously. I mean, if you take the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, this treaty is long due, but this treaty has been seen as one of the more adhered to nuclear armament a, a, a treaty on Earth today. But you have 184 countries that have signed up to this treaty, 168 that have ratified, and yet this treaty is still pending ratification in the Middle East. Iran, Egypt and Israel have all signed the treaty. We can create through this treaty a condition of dialogue, dialogue, understanding, mutual trust, because it always starts in the Middle East with mistrust or distrust. And that's one thing that Foreign Minister Zari was talking about again. Do you think there is a way forward, though, for both Iran and the US to try and find a meeting point, a middle ground where they can discuss? Because at the moment they seem just so, to the viewer at home, just poles apart. I think there is. If you look at what happened in North Korea, uh, I mean, for long people never thought that there would be an opportunity of uh, dialogue between US and North Korea. Why shouldn't we think that there is a possibility between Iran and the US? I think both sides have uh, shown interest in finding a, a solution uh, and finding an opportunity for dialogue. Uh, both President Trump and uh, President Rouhani have expressed their will to, to sit on a table or around the table to discuss, but they've all given some condition. I mean, it's the condition that basically makes me say that sometimes we have to sacrifice our pride and then put our ego a little bit behind and then look at the international community's interests. I think there's a way to approach this issue in a way where everyone feels comfortable. Does the fact that Saudi Arabia, for example, is currently talking to the US about nuclear capability and nuclear armaments, because there have been talks in Washington, they haven't quite reached, reached the point for any sort of formal agreement because Riyadh doesn't want to sign up to the checks and balances required to have nuclear material or nuclear development on its soil for civilian purposes to be developed for milita military purposes uh, and that worries the US to, to give them that. I don't think it worries only the US. I think when you talk about checks and balances, when you talk about nuclear uh, non-proliferation in the context, the geopolitical context we're living in now, if you don't get those check and balance right, I think it's a door open for many, many situations that will be uncontrollable. So how do we uh, ask you know, one side you know, of the world to say, you, you can only do this, and then to the other side we're allowed to say, you can go for it without assigning the check and balance that goes with the, uh, I mean, the framework of non-proliferation and disarmament. I think that's something that is key. It's key for the US, but it's key for the international community through the many agreements that are still standing. Saudi says it wants to have a, a nuclear capability to counter Iran. Are they justified in their concern for what Iran has developed over the past few decades? Iran has always argued that they have no intention to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, they say they have the right to nuclear capability for peaceful uses. Uh, there's a framework to control this under the NPT, and then there's an agency that deal with this issue. I think as long as we get Iran to comply with uh, the agreement that is set for to making sure that they don't uh, pass that limit where uh, the, the perception will be that they have the intention of developing nuclear weapon, I think we are in good books. What we have to do is to make sure there is a, a strict compliance to those agreements that are set for, the GCPOA being one of them, and then many other international agreements. Uh, you mentioned the Comprehensive Nuclear uh, Test Ban Treaty. You know, I've always argued that uh, within the GCPOA, we could have included the CTBT as part of the deal, since Iran, 
has always argued that they, they, they have no intention uh, to build a nuclear weapon. But in the GCPOA, you have two major countries that have not ratified the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So how do you come and tell somebody uh, that, you know, I want your doorstep to be clean, and then when mine is not clean? Mm -hmm. So that's the situation that probably put the CTBT in a difficult uh, in situation. In terms of the JCPOA, I mean, do you think it's dead in the water at the moment? I wouldn't think so. I think there's still hope. Uh, let's hope that uh, uh, people come to sense, and as I said, that we put our, we sacrifice our pride uh, to a certain extent, and then we find uh, room for dialogue. Well, you touched on, on North Korea, and of course it sort of links into the US's attitude both to Iran and North Korea, with Iran that says they have no desire for a nuclear weapon, the US has come down on them quite heavily, yet with North Korea, who openly say we do have a nuclear arsenal, um, and we do have the missiles that could possibly be uh, or carry a, a, a nuclear warhead, the US is happy to, to talk and to negotiate and to accommodate Pyongyang. Yeah, I think, uh, Soil, you, you're touching exactly uh, one of the challenges that, uh, you know, people like myself are having when we talk to uh, youth in the developing world. I mean, people always tell me exactly what you say. North Korea is uh, showing muscles with regard to nuclear weapon capability. And Iran isn't at this level yet because they haven't tested so far. So why are we treating those two differently? In one hand, we have North Korea that has shown some capability with regard to possessing nuclear weapon and uh, an opportunity to talk to them. And then come this question, does it mean that you need to show muscles before people agree to sit on the table with you? That's a question that many young people are asking me. And I have no answer to this question except in saying that, you know, we will try and, uh, and encourage dialogue both with Iran and North Korea, even if they're in the two dif different situations. How unpredictable is North Korea in terms of the diplomatic attitude that you experience? I wouldn't say that North Korea is unpredictable. I would it say does seem unpredictable to the viewer at home and to the ordinary person, whether they're in Mombasa, in Edinburgh, in Islamabad, New Delhi, or Johannesburg. I'll put it the other <laughs> way. I would say those who are dealing with North Korea are too predictable. That's the way I would put it. Okay. Uh, North Korea can be perceived unpredictable, but when you go to talk to a country that is testing, the only country that is testing nuclear weapon in this 21st century. And you don't put forward the framework that we all agreed internationally. What do you expect people to think? But North Korea is also very concerned about its own, you might say, post-nuclear security. It feels that its sovereignty will be impinged, weakened, they will be invaded. I mean, how do you reassure uh, Pyongyang that that isn't the intention from the conversations you've been having with world leaders? Trust comes with respect. So if North Korea feel respected, they will feel trusted, and then they will come to a, a dialogue as it has started. But when you come to dialogue, it's all about give and take. What is North Korea getting out of the discussion that are happening so far? They feel insecure. What can we bring on the table to make them feel secure? We have international agreement, we have regional agreement, we have dialogue not only with the United States, we have dialogue with Russia, we have dialogue with uh, many other countries, South Korea for that matter. How do we create the condition for the North to feel at ease with the South first, because that's where it matters? They've always argued that the forces around their border are making them feel very insecure. They've said, if you remove those forces, we will stop testing, and then we'll come to a table of discussion and then give more and more. So how do we deal with this situation? That's something that is beyond my paycheck. But it's also beyond the US's remit to lift sanctions. They would have to go back to the UN for several issues when it comes to sanctions. It's not just a US decision alone. While you can have those conversations, while President Trump is willing to talk uh, to Kim Jong-un, uh, he has also got his hands tied slightly and that he can't act alone. Of course he can't act alone. Uh, but when you mention, when you mention sanction, uh, listening recently again to Foreign Minister Zarif, 
He's been arguing strongly that sanction will never work in the end. He gave the number of centrifuges that Iran has before the sanction and the number of centrifuges that they have under the sanction. They've gone from a couple of hundred to tens of thousands. So what does it mean? And they've been strongly saying that they will not surrender. He gave an example uh, recently again that if for 7,000 years uh, they haven't been wiped out of this planet, it meant they still have a long way to go. So you have a country that takes its culture and its history very strongly and uh, takes uh, the Middle East as part of his, his DNA and then feel that they can find a solution regionally and then feel also threatened by, I wouldn't say the rest of the world, but a part of the world that is saying, you know, you're not allowed to do this, you can only do this, but we're not creating the condition for you to not do what we don't think you should do. Then, in another hand, we have all those agreements that we're asking Iran to adhere to, but others are not forced the same way to adhere to. You mentioned North Korea, but I'll give you a simple example in my part of the world. When a country in Africa wants, for instance, to join uh, the UN Security Council as a non-permanent member, what comes on the table is, in the negotiation, they say, okay, yes, we would vote for you, or we will uh, you know, accept you in the Security Council, but uh, have you thought about ratifying this treaty or this agreement or joining uh, another framework that is internationally adhered to? But we should do that to everyone. And then people feel safe, and then people feel trusted, and then they can trust multilateral diplomacy. In terms of diplomacy, let's head to South Asia, because the impasse between India and Pakistan, two uh, nuclear-powered uh, countries, uh, and certainly with large um, stockpiles of, of nuclear material, uh, have had a long-running animosity that is perhaps a, a, as long as uh, the end of the Second World War, really. Uh, they were also on either side of the Cold War. Pakistan supported the USA, India indirectly, the U former USSR. This past year has been very difficult for uh, both countries over territorial claims. And there is a thought that their nuclear arsenal will increase significantly by 2025. How much of a concern is that for you? If, if I take India and Pakistan uh, with regard to the treaty that I'm dealing with, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, I would say Pakistan has shown, uh, has been forthcoming because they are now an observer to the, to the CTBT. Uh, they've opened up the possibility of a regional agreement with India, uh, still awaiting India's response to this. Uh, they've said clearly that uh, they are for a world free of nuclear weapon, as long as all parties come to the table and then agree that this is a way forward. They've shown interest in uh, moving towards a peaceful solution of the regional problem that they have, at least with regard to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. It is my hope that India will uh, show some interest in that respect and that will create a condition of a regional dialogue, at least a bilateral discussion between India and Pakistan, that will create a condition for stability and peace uh, in that part of the world. But how do we do that? I think we do that if I take, for instance, the issue of joining the nuclear supplies group that has been uh, uh, in discussion for so long. You talk about check and balances. I mean, should the international community put condition on India's accession to the nuclear supplies group, one of them being the signature of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty? It's been on the table when people ask me that question, for sure. Uh, I would say that I would love to see that. But how do we put India in a situation that they feel comfortable enough to see that in the check and balances, signing the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty does no damage. And if any, it will help them create the condition of trust that others feel they need to be joining the nuclear supplies group. And then where do you put Pakistan? This is the question, because yeah. as soon as they have um, regional difficulties, normally mm -hmm. over territorial claims over Kashmir, mm -hmm. there's often talk by the extreme right in either country mm -hmm. that it's only about pressing a button. Exactly. And that 
and that concerns, it does concern the international community, it concerns nationals from each of those two countries too, that you know, we would potentially, possibly, go to war. Soil, you're absolutely right. When I hear the word pushing the button, I mean, it, it frightened me. Because, frightened me. Uh, it does, because my biggest hope is that when we get close to any catastrophe, I think we come to a sense somehow. And I think I see no way in this civilized world, no way in this 21st century, any decent government or decent political leader thinking about pushing the button of the nuclear weapon because they know how devastating that could be. Because it's not a war that anyone can win. It's for all of us to lose. It's about how many you lose and how many I lost. That's basically what it is. In recent weeks, we've seen the Turkish President Erdogan mm -hmm. talk about his country should have a nuclear arsenal, yet Turkey signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1980 and also signed in 1996 the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. I wouldn't think so, really, Soil. I don't think... It is, is President Erdogan just talking off the top of his head? He talks about the fact that Israel has, has missiles and a nuclear arsenal, but nobody touches them. No, I think we are in a, a political game where it's a mind war, I would put it this way. I think people uh, putting themselves in a situation where it's, uh, it becomes easy to talk about uh, the perception of double standard that they see in uh, multilateral diplomacy. And that's probably what pushes uh, President Erdogan to talk about why one part has nuclear weapon in this region and then other wouldn't have it. Uh, but I think we all agree that the fact that we've been able for the past 75 years to contain the proliferation of nuclear weapons to five or possibly nine, as people talk about it, uh, is already in itself a great achievement. But at the same time, uh, one needs to take what President Erdogan says seriously and then um, always create the condition of dialogue that will uh, get him to specify what he means and then how we can deal with the situation. That neatly brings me to a conversation that needs to be had, really, between Russia and the United States. They are pulling back from the agreements that they've had for several decades, signed uh, in the Reagan-Gorbachev era. And there is a real concern internationally that we're now looking towards a new arms race and certainly a new nuclear missiles race. History has shown that Russia, when Russia and the United States are talking, the world is a better place. Why? Because they are the two superpower in terms of uh, nuclear arsenal. But not only that, it's the influence that they have in the different regions uh, of this planet. It's true, many international agreements or bilateral agreements between those two are falling apart. And I want to give an opportunity through the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty to create the condition of trust, not only between the US and Russia, among the P5. We have two uh, among the P5 countries that have not ratified the CTBT, that's China and the United States. What's it going to take to get the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty ratified globally? Is it going to happen in our lifetime? I hope so. Uh, if, uh, if the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty doesn't progress in a way where we can foresee its entry into force, uh, I don't see a future for nuclear disarmament. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty today is a low-hanging fruit in arms control and non-proliferation. If we can't catch that fruit, where do we go? We have the Prohibition Treaty that is now in place, I mean, by many states that have signed this treaty, but the P5, the nuclear weapon states, are refusing to adhere to this Prohibition Treaty. So where do we stand? We have in one hand people who think we should ban all nuclear weapons from this planet, and people who feel that testing is a step towards banning this, this is what I feel. If you can't get the world to ban nuclear tests, explosion once and for all, how do we get them to ban nuclear weapons? Lucina Zerbo, uh, Executive Secretary for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.